Hi FlossTube, Stitch Removes back with you here doing the Know Your Needleworker tag suggested by Whimsy Daisical. That was a great suggestion, Nicole, thank you for that. Uh, loved your answers, I've seen a bunch of other uh, floss tubers have uh, re replied to this, so uh, I will certainly do so. I've got the questions back there behind you. I have a mug of tea brewing, and uh, as soon as that's ready I'll get right into it. I have a couple of notes here just to remind myself because as has been demonstrated, I can ramble off into the weeds sometimes. So I may go to these occasionally and I will try to keep them down here so that doesn't happen. Um, so let me go grab the mug of tea. I was waiting for a dramatic beep here but I didn't time it correctly so um, I'll go take care of that and then we'll get into all the great questions. Oh. I'll pad a little bit here. Um, first explanation, because the most basic way to know your needleworker is by his name, and I have not used my name, and there is a reason for that. Maybe it's an overabundance of caution. I'm sure as I get to know you all, if we talk in other medias, uh, media spaces or however, um, you can know my name. I don't mind that. It's just that Mrs. Stitcher Moose's career is such that she deals with sensitive health issues and that can result in people being people so there's an element of privacy that she needs to maintain and to that extent I don't want to get too specific about some things it's a pain in the butt but there it is dramatic beep there's the T anyway that's why I'm not using my name Moose is fine that is, you know, moose are gangly and weird and can be found in the woods. That's an apt moniker for this guy right here. Let me get my tea. Be right back. And here I am, as promised, tea in hand. Um, I have water too in case I want it, but... Um, I don't know, I just, I like tea, I mentioned that, and it's warm and soothing, and that's good for the throat when you're going to talk. So, um, moose trivia, somebody said they love the moose trivia, so I'll throw another one out there. Um, I use, duality is going to be a theme through this, um, and oh, God, I get so distracted so easily, but I think of things, and then they have to, they just, they go from here to here, and some people have a thing that has a gate that lets thoughts queue up and come out, and my thoughts just go, hey, what, then run through the gate. So, that's why that happens. So... I say so a lot. That's a verbal crutch I should do away with. I'll try. This is a learning experience for us all. It's also a little like therapy. It's both at the same time. Um, what was the original thought? Hold on. Right. It had to do with my mug of tea. I use Christmas mugs all year round. We have several of them in this size and shape and another one that's slightly, it has a more crisp image but still wintry and, and Christmassy. I like Christmas. However, at the same time, I refuse to acknowledge or sing or participate in Christmas music until Santa Claus has appeared at the end of the Thanksgiving, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade that is when Christmas music may appear and be enjoyed and sung. Yes, you could get it all year round, like a nice warm Christmas mug. But I don't acknowledge that it's a Christmas mug all year round, only when it gets time for Christmas. I'm getting like some psychology here that it's warm and comforting and maybe so is Christmas. Maybe not for you, maybe that Christmas isn't your jam. 
and that's cool. I'm sure you have stuff that's warm and comforts you. Maybe it's YouTube or floss tube or stitching, and that's good. Cradle it and let it warm you. Um, if, if that sounded facetious, it really wasn't. I have a problem with, I speak sarcasm sometimes too fluently, and it's hard to tell, so I'll try and do like a disclaimer. It's like the text world needs an emoticon for sarcasm. I wish I had like a button or a light that would come on when it was or wasn't happening. Um, time for a sip. God, I just, I love tea. It's because my mom um, was first generation American off the boat from an Irish English immigration situation in the early 20th century and um, it was all tea all the time at our house. Great big mugs of tea. There's nothing a little Teddy couldn't take care of. That's a horrible series of accents there. I, I apologize to anyone who had to hear that. Uh, so, moose trivia. That's how I am with the Christmas songs, and yet I use the mugs all year round. Um, let's get into the first question already, shall we? Or we're going to be here all day. But long videos are okay. And honestly, I have no idea where this is going other than I have the questions up there and I had just a couple of things that I didn't want to forget to mention. So grab your stitching or whatever you're doing. Sit down, strap in. Let's see where this ride goes. Um... What the, was that the first question? What do you do for a living? Yes, there are multiple pages of notes. Jiminy Christmas. Uh, know your needle worker tag. Thing. Is it... I knew there was a first question. Why is it not up there? I'm like a kindergartner, I swear. The first question's supposed to be, where do you live? And I know I'd said about the name thing that I wouldn't be specific, but there are probably enough clues that you can already figure it out if you were that keen on doing whatever stalker thing I'm worried about with the name thing. Hmm. Tried to make my glasses steam up there to be funny, and it didn't work. Comedy's hard, folks. Where do I live? Let's say... It's the Mid-Atlantic, United States-ish area. And I'm sure there will be other clues that you can figure out. You know, there's boats, and if I ever mention that I went to the Naval Academy, that could clue you in as well. Um, is that good enough for where do I live? I'll say that I have lived in the past, there's a place I can go. Um, I was born in New York City, Brooklyn, as you can tell by my accent. <laughs> no. I had a Brooklyn accent when until I was maybe, like I found a cassette tape that I made when I was 11 and we lived in New Jersey and I had already started to weirdly lose my accent even though our whole neighborhood was like you had picked up part of Brooklyn and just just a whole big ladle full of Irish and Italians and plopped them into the middle of New Jersey. And uh, I don't know, somehow started to lose my accent. Um, so lived in uh, New York City proper till uh, I was seven and grew up the rest of time in New Jersey, high school and all that, Naval Academy. And then um, I have also lived in uh, Rhode Island and uh, for eight years lived in Jacksonville and that was that started as a, an Uncle Sam thing and oh that is a neat segue into what do I do for a living or what do I do when I'm not cross stitching as Nicole aptly uh, put that um, because what I mostly do if I'm not cross stitching is this. Um, 
So there are a couple things you could call it. I'm a semi-retired military officer. I have had a civilian career after that, which often, as my kids were in their formative years, took me away from the house before they woke up and got me home after they went to bed. So I missed a lot. Um, you know, tried to do what I could, but was chasing the almighty dollar and, and, you know, that happens. So when it became an option to not have to do that because Mrs. Stitcher Moose is just the bee's knees, uh, she is, you know, she screwed up and did great at her job. So we're in a, a fortunate position in that, um, She's doing a breadwinner thing, and I'm doing a little of, you know, residual. And, uh, but mostly doing the, you know, you can call it a, a bunch of other things. Uh, stay at home dad, because uh, since I've been home for a couple of years, um, I have gotten to do, toward the end of our older son's high school years, um, got to do his activities. And our younger son was into a lot of sports and got to do those things and a lot of volunteering and church stuff and things that um, I couldn't even sometimes do if, even if they were on the weekend. Such was the nature of the work that I uh, used to do uh, in the civilian world. So our kids were born after the military. God bless people that can have kids and be in the military at once. That was not something we felt like we could do or wanted to do. And, um, and then... You know, I went and had work that took me uh, away more hours than shore duty did. I'm answering the questions a little out of order, but it makes sense to do so now. Uh, we have uh, two boys, the older of whom, College Moose, is a sophomore at a university roughly six hours from here. So draw a circle and pick one. Um, and I realize the edges of the circle will be wavy because, yeah. Uh, and we have Junior Moose, who is a junior in high school. And what was I going to say about them that had to do with... Oh, in that we are about to have two kids in college at the same time. And scholarships are great, but school be expensive. And nobody wants their kids to have 15 years worth of college loans. So... Yeah, this should probably get Uncle Sam and his greenbacks going back into my pocket. So, that's good for a living, and um, have also answered, do we have any kids? I'm going to take a break to have some tea and reorganize my thoughts. Name three other hobbies besides stitching. Uh, very simply, woodworking, music, and astronomy. And I don't do any of those as much as I would like to. Um, stitching is great because it's quiet and it's very zen. And all of those other things can be zen as well, but woodworking can be loud and messy and music can be loud and messy and astronomy I don't know how you'd make astronomy loud cheering if you found a new supernova or something I guess but mostly it's done at night and it's quiet uh, we do have a telescope and it is a magical thing if you have, if, if you are open to magic, which I hope you are, and you look through a telescope and you see the rings of Saturn, that is the moment when your view of the universe will probably change. And I know that it was mine. Because you, you're actually, it's not seeing a picture. It's looking through a piece of glass, or a series of pieces of glass, at a thing that you could point to in the sky, and it's really there, it's just 
relatively small because it's far away, but you look at it through the thing it makes it bigger, like reading glasses writ large, and you're seeing the rings of Saturn. Which, even though they are a billion, with a B, miles away, they are in places, I think, 10 feet thick, and yet, because they're made of uh, partially ice crystals that are very reflective, you can see them from a billion miles away. Moose trivia. I mentioned I was interested in accents. It's a fascinating thing that there are, I guess because of the exchange of cultures is accelerating rapidly because of the internet and easy travel and that kind of thing, but there are uh, a lot of British, Australian, you know, UK, uh, other English speaking, even non-native English speaking, but other uh, in particular have noticed a lot of uh, you know English and Australian actors who come to the uh, U.S. or whatever. They're in some U.S. production and use an American accent. And it is, on occasion, very, very good. Uh, it's often very good. These are professional actors. And you don't, you may not know. I can think of a half a dozen cases where I did not know an actor, actress, was not American. They're using an American accent. But there is a phrase that I know, on like five or six different occasions, has given them away. And it must be so deeply ingrained, and I don't know if it's not noticed or known about, I don't know how it could not be known about by uh, accent, dialogue, dialect coaches, but it is this. When an American refers to something that is some, something distant, or some place they have to drive, or, or a place that's not where they are, they will say something like, oh, uh, oh well, New York's like, uh, you know, can't drive there in an hour because New York is uh, 180 miles away. It's that phrase, miles away, that Americans put the accent on the syllable way. Everywhere else in the English-speaking world, from what I can tell, the accent is put on the word miles. Or it, it could even be a, a length of time, if something is years away, or um, Glasgow is miles away from London. That's, I didn't even try to do an accent there. Um, I, I, I don't know. Has anybody else ever noticed that? I will be sitting, and my family laughs at me now, because we'll be sitting here, I'll be cross-stitching, and they're watching something... You know, um, I haven't seen Hugh Laurie do it yet because his American accent is flippin' perfect. top of my head has has done it that I've noticed but it's a thing and that was a very long-winded moose trivia thing but that's a very specific piece of trivia there let's have some tea shall we ah oh, it's cooler now I can slog it down that's so delicious so uh, woodworking music and astronomy uh, woodworking. I have built some of the furniture that's in this house, if I remember, I really hope I do, to uh, put in some pictures, either here or at the end, um, of uh, a couple of nightstands that I built and some other stuff. Uh, help build this coffee table. Um, so woodworking, uh, I do love 
it's another Zen thing. It's just it's a bigger, louder Zen thing than cross stitching. But again, it's a hobby that I like because when the, the process is fun and you have to learn the woods and how they work together and how, what you have to allow for with moisture and humidity and drying and you have to understand how different woods react and grain and there's just a lot of things that are analogous to, to stitching. But it's just hard to do because I don't have a workshop. Um, so, you know, the table saw and the band saw and the router and planer and uh, miter saw and all that jazz is um, not, you know, set up in the basement the way it could be if uh, it were not a comfortable living space. So, I uh, have built some furniture and um, would love to build more and do stuff like birdhouses and things. I don't know. We all wish we had more time to, to do, you know, things that you'd like to do. Uh, music, uh, again, I'll uh, maybe I'll provide a picture of, of the band set up. Um, have I mentioned that I have the band set up in the corner of the basement waiting for uh, Foo Fighters to show up and provide a private concert? Foo Fighters! Woo! Because I'm not going to the big concert in D.C. Yeah, I'm, I'm bitter about that one. Uh, so I, um, my sort of older brother taught me six guitar chords when I was 12, and I've been playing those six chords plus a few others, and I got interested in the blues and electric guitar and that kind of thing, so I have all of those instruments, and uh, can, I took piano lessons for years, so I can sort of passively play keyboards or piano. I've got drums because Dave Grohl is rock Jesus, and you just, you need drums for stuff. And what else? At some point I will sing. Maybe not now, but it, it will happen. And I'm not great. And unfortunately, the classic rock jams that I want to belt out in the car, my voice isn't, it's too low a register, like I can't hit even some of the notes in my favorite Foo Fighters song, which is Walk. That's the uh, intro to all my videos, is uh, the opening uh, little bit from Walk, which is a very fine song and, and won a Grammy, uh, I think, in 2012 for Rock Performance of the Year. Um, <laughs> Foo Fighters' recent album, too, is great. I'm getting into music, jumping around. Hold on, rein it in. All right. Woodworking, music, and astronomy. Um, yeah, those are, those are good. If I could build a base for my telescope and incorporate the ability to play music while doing astronomy, that would be... And like incorporate a chair that I could do cross stitching if it was cloudy. That's the dream right there. <coughs> yes, uh, well, no. What, what a, just an awful way to answer the question. Again, sort of a, a duality thing. Um, we have had pets. Our first, um, and I, I've heard other people refer to it this way you know, your first baby before your actual babies. Uh, was our, our dog Bo when we first got married and uh, we got him for $25 in LA that's lower Alabama not Los Angeles uh, we lived in Pensacola at the time I was in flight school and um, we got Bo he was a golden retriever Irish setter mix and he was a fantastic dog and actually I have a cross stitch of Bo I didn't do this this was done by granny Mrs. Stitcher Moose's uh, grandmother, my most direct inspiration for doing cross stitch. This actually hangs in our house, and um, she spelled his name correctly, B-O, not B-E-A-U, or B-E-A-U-X, or however else you might spell that. Um, we, did, we got him and brought him home, and he was very listless, and of course sad to be away from his siblings and, and all that. Uh, but he didn't want to play, and he would eat a little and pee on the carpet, and 
you know, all that puppy stuff and chew on things. He chewed remotes relentlessly for his whole life. I bet we went through ten remotes in probably eight years that we first had him uh, before we moved up here. Um, so, oh, Bo is, uh, yeah, yeah, that's where I was going with this. Uh, we didn't name him for three days, and then I was playing a Hank Williams Jr. album, and that was the first time he played. I think we were throwing a ball across the carpet, and he went and got it and actually brought it back. And it was the first, like, lively puppy thing that he did. So, naturally, his name had to be Bo Cephas. He was born to boogie. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so he was Bo. And he lived for 14 years. And we lived in an apartment, and we lived in a rented house, and we lived in a house another house we rented and a house that we bought and uh, that's that's the military life that was all within about six six or eight years and Bo uh, was with us all that time and he was starting to feel some health issues and you know how they say when you know, the, the trope is that you um, I say trope instead of meme because I don't know if meme is the right pronunciation or if it's mem or meme Mimi, somebody educate me. No, actually, I'm, I'm okay not knowing that. I think it's better somehow, because then I'd be then I'd want to say it all the time, and my kids would be even more embarrassed than they already are of me. Um, right. Again, with the thoughts, and I'm trying to mentally filter them out, and that just causes a vapor lock thing to happen. What I thought of there was, because I said kids, thinking I was weird, at the same time, my kids are certainly a reflection of, of me. Astronomy being one of my hobbies and interests, and physics in general, I'm kind of a physics nerd. Uh, I was a math major in college and always been a math guy, numbers guy, but physics speaks to me on a soulful level. So, College Moose, um, when you have an interest and you share that interest with your children and it ingrains or imprints on them so indelibly that they fully by choice become that you feel that in a place inside that is reserved for no other feeling, I think. So, College Moose is in college being a physics and astronomy major. And if I ponder on that too long, I'm going to get all misty-eyed. And I'm not even kidding. Um, junior Moose is very much amused by puns, as is his father. And he has also changed one letter in that, and he is, much to his mother's dismay, the moment I said mother, if you heard that buzz, that was a text from the lovely wife, Mrs. Stitcher Moose. It's like magic is happening here. So, oh, and I better click on that so it doesn't keep doing the thing that it does. So one letter different from puns is pugs. Junior Moose loves the concept of pugs and what the internet is doing with it and all the pictures and the conversations that end up in group texts between all the members of the Moose family about pugs and about those pictures are a wonder to behold. I've archived some of them. If I can find a way to share those, maybe I will. So, pugs, right. That actually kind of ties into the pets thing. So that worked out well. Sometimes the, all the things that are waiting at the gate to come out of my head line up nicely and walk through hand in hand. And so they have, as we don't want a pug for our next dog. 
So here's where I was going with the bow story. When you tell your kids the trope, that's how this circle started, that when a dog has to be put down or has dies, and if they're little and you don't really think it's the time yet to get into the conversation of actual animal death and that whole mortality thing, you might tell them that the dog has had to move to a farm where he gets to run and play and chase rabbits all the time and live for years and years and years. That actually kind of happened with Bo because while his health was failing in Florida, we moved up here and we more or less live on a big wide open piece of property where uh, he could run and chase squirrels and rabbits and bark at the deer and darn if he didn't live another like four and a half years after we moved here which was amazing and that was that was a nice gift so there's another little piece of magic that that happened with Bo. anyway he ultimately he was 14 and um we had to say goodbye to him oh gonna get misty again um deflect that with the story of the next dogs which is kind of unfortunate right from the get-go they were rescue dogs. I think that the DNA did not entirely work between Golden Retriever and Rhodesian Ridgeback because they had, dude, we had two uh, female siblings from a litter and they, they just didn't, there's just something wasn't quite right. They were very sweet. They were very nice. They were family dogs. They were lovely. Um, but they weren't as playful, and I've never, ever in my life seen a dog that would not stick his head out the car window. And the older, not the older, but the, the one who lived longer, um, never ever did that. I don't know if that was a thing where she didn't like it because the wind whistled and made her head hurt or something, but I literally have never seen another dog that would ride anywhere in a car and not either try or have its head out the window. Um, so the, uh, the one dog of those two, a wave of parvovirus went through our community and how in a rural kind of spread out community, I mean, dozens and dozens of dogs got the virus and died. And, uh, so did she, but yet her sister didn't. So there's another weird thing because parvovirus is, is, you know, passed, I guess, dog to dog. And so how one and two dogs in the same house, one got it and one didn't or one got it and survived and one didn't is a mystery. So the, uh, the, old, the one who lived longer, uh, just um, uh, again, the right thing to do was to uh, uh, pick a day and say goodbye to her. So we did because she, she couldn't walk anymore and there were other issues. So it just no quality of life at all, which is very sad. Um, so that was, uh, that was last year. So now we're kind of between dogs. We have researched, we've taken those quizzes that tell you what kind of dog, and we looked at the Breed 101 and a million YouTube videos and, and dog TV shows, and we watched the dog show. After Santa Claus appears at the Thanksgiving Day Parade, then right after that, the dog show starts. And that is a great tradition. And, uh, Whoa, there's a question. I am writing that down so I don't forget. Traditions. Because I, I know I'm going to come up with other questions, as uh, Nicole said in her original. Um, you know, add if you want. So I, maybe not to add to answer within this, because this, this will end up going on forever. Um, but in a separate video, Maybe I'll come up with some other um, know your needleworker type tag things. So uh, we are looking for a dog, family dog. We want a smaller one than kind of the golden retriever thing, but we want a playful dog who will chase a ball and bring it back and that kind of thing. Uh, we got into uh, tollers, Nova Scotia duck tolling retrievers. That's what the quiz kept telling us. We went and visited some from a couple different breeders, and there's just something about their energy 
it wasn't, you know, there's this, and then there's this, and it wasn't there. So, back to the quizzes, looking again, trying to answer maybe a little differently, so it would take us a slightly different direction, and where are we, where we are now, and I think this is really going to, to be the one, at least from what I've seen, not having gone and visited breeders yet, but Brittany Spaniel. I guess the official name is actually Brittany, but I say Brittany Spaniel so people know I don't want a, a, a middle-aged pop singer chasing a ball in our yard. That would be weird. <laughs> Funny, but wrong. So we want a Brittany Spaniel and a liver colored, I think. That's the, the palette that appeals to me. There's a, there are a couple different options uh, where there's a, like a lighter brown and liver and maybe the, I think in America the AKC lets there be a third option. Liver is the one, um, the, the uh, Brittany that we have, that I have on the laptop as a, a desktop background now is a liver Brittany and that's that seems to be pleasing so that's where we think we are if you have a Brittany I'd love feedback on that but again we have to go visit them and sometime in the next year or so uh, we will have another pet and we'll name it the same way I'm sure have it around for a few days and figure out what makes sense so next question They don't know. But if they did, yes, they would. Who inspired me to start a YouTube channel? To borrow Nicole's answer, all of you. Literally. I, I can't name one specific, and that's that's a cop-out, but I am going to name some specific uh, people that, that are memorable for one reason or another. But literally, why I actually had, why I thought I should do a YouTube channel, I thought every time I saw, especially somebody's first video, and I thought, well, God, I need to make a video. That's why I need, I want to talk about this, and I want to ask questions, and I want to say how thankful I am that uh, for all the stuff that I've learned, from FlossTube. Who can I speak to specifically? And if I don't mention you, please don't feel slighted because I literally, I have watched over 400 videos in the last, you know, in the month that I had started. It might be more than a month now. Um, but over the course of several weeks, I watched hundreds of videos. And I, I mean, I picked up something from everybody. And Everyone's first video literally was an inspiration, so don't don't um, feel bad if I if I don't mention you. Um, the first floss tube video that I the way I found the community was through a YouTube channel named Nordly. I think her name is Nancy, and the story actually of why her channel name is Nordly is very cute and I just thought of another question that I'm going to write down do you have a story for your screen name or other thing I'll, I'll put that at, at the end as a like an official tag thing anyway um, that was the first video that wasn't like a tutorial of how to do X, Y, Z, whatever. All cross-stitch tutorials are how to do X, aren't they? You get it? Sort of. Okay. Nordley's video was one that it, it was very much, and you know, she is 20-something and bubbly and energetic and very much not a dry voiceover um, this you know fixed camera zoom on a piece of canvas it was personable and fun 
and you know had the cute story of how her name came about and um, you know and where she's from so it was a little bit international and just it so that was the first like fun floss tube video that I saw and that linked me to others and eventually not too many videos down the road I found the floss tube playlist by wonderfully hopeless and that is what I was able to as I'm learning how YouTube works I was able to bring that list over and make it private on my side and reorder it so that I could watch it very easily from oldest to newest it's maybe sort of an OCD thing but just logically I didn't want to go from newest to oldest I wanted to see the progression because I could see the people were making 10 and 20 and 30 videos and I wanted to see or like tags I wanted to see the tag initiated and then see how it built or how people answered it and and go in you know historical order so that's how I got to all the inspiration was I think there were 477 floss tube videos when I nabbed that that playlist and brought it over um, gosh who else well amongst them um, I'll say there were seeing that there were among the 477 there were a couple of male cross stitchers and that made me think okay well cross stitching doesn't have to be grandma in the corner and it could certainly be a guy uh, Tim Walker is one who is doing an amazing um, I think it's a heaven and earth design and it's the it's the biggest one that I've seen it was a map of Middle Earth it, inconceivably huge bat as I now understand as I learned another term um, Tim Walker was one and then if there is an opposite more of an opposite of the grandma sitting in a rocking chair doing cross stitch if there's more of an opposite than me it's tattoos and a biker mustache and that's Michael so shout out bro several others that made me think that stitching could be awesome and that I learned a ton from as I was being inspired to do videos um, Mrs. Milky Bar Kid whose instructional videos are fantastic and your work is meticulous and that is an inspiration uh, stitching may and your accent is please it that's adorable come on um, and we, we do know what you're saying please don't worry about that um, and then uh, who else um, another early ish one that I saw that said that that um, stitching could be just kind of you know a lot of talking about just how stitching folds into your natural day-to-day -day life and and how car rides and stitching got along and that was the stitching anthropologist um, and then the specific one that I remember commenting on because after I saw all these videos I would think oh I need to make one I need to do this I need to start a, I need to sit down and figure out how to do a video and then do a video and then get it find out how to put it on YouTube and do that and it's not that hard if you don't want to do editing you don't have to if you just want to record a thing and just put it up there, it's, it's really pretty easy to do uh, with the tools that you probably already have so that specific one that I commented on was probably Emily Chadwick's first video because I think on that video I commented something like I keep seeing people's first videos and thinking I should do a video and I really need to commit to doing that and she replied to that comment with something like do it come on just do it already gosh there's probably an eye roll that I couldn't see that that was I think within days after that I put the commitment into the description on my channel and then I actually did it before the date I had put in for the commitment and it was directly as a result of that comment and reply that that happened so 
there's a very complex wandering how I was inspired to actually do these videos thing. Um, yeah, there you go.